Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri, and by these fine organizations. What if you could step back in time and talk with some of Kansas City's most historic figures? The innovators and achievers who left their mark on our town, on our nation. What would you ask if you could meet the past? This week, Crosby takes to the high plains with Pulitzer Prize winning author Willa Cather, known for her stories featuring the strong men and women of Nebraska. In 1925, when F. Scott Fitzgerald published The Great Gatsby, he wrote Willa Cather to say he knew he had plagiarized Daisy Buchanan from Marion Forrester in A Lost Lady. In 1930, Sinclair Lewis won the Nobel Prize and said it was Willa Cather who deserved it. In 1946, Truman Capote was doing research for The New Yorker in the Society Library and caught in a snowstorm uh, with a lady he had noticed in the library before, uh, she invited him to come next door uh, to have a cup of hot chocolate. She asked him what was his, who was his favorite writer? Willa Cather, he said. His favorite books, My Mortal Enemy and A Lost Lady are two perfect works, he said. She said, I'm Willa Cather. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Willa Cather. Yes, yes, yes. I see. You have uh, that, that picture was taken in 1912. 1912. Yes, when I was uh, editor, managing editor of McClure's. 1912, managing editor of McClure's magazine, which was then the highest circulation magazine in the United States, I think actually in the world. You were just publishing your third book, Alexander's Bridge, and yet there was some dissatisfaction in your life. I hadn't quite figured out my passion yet in Alexander's Bridge. Sarah Owen Jewett told me I would never truly be a great writer until I ceased to admire and started to remember. To, to find that, you needed to go and, and, and seek your, your passion somewhere else. You needed to go and visit your brother. I took a leave of absence. I went to visit my brother in, in Winslow, Arizona. The whole way down from Trinidad, Colorado to, to New Mexico, there was this one continuous purple mountain that just tuned one up. And we got to Albuquerque and the, ah, oh, such color. It, the Lord had set the stage splendidly there. Oh, we went on horseback and we saw the Grand Canyon and we went down into New Mexico and uh, there was a, a priest who showed us all these Spanish missions and Hopi Indian pueblos and adobe huts. And I was absolutely fascinated by the ancient cliff dwellings of the vanished Indian tribes, hundreds of them. That was a day that etched itself in my memory forever. And, and the, the canyons, Walnut Canyon, and this becomes Panther Canyon, mm -hmm. does it not, in mm -hmm. Song of the Lark. Um, but it's more than just a stage setting for your novel, isn't it? It was as if I, she were, had an appointment to meet herself sometimes, somewhere, the rest of herself. That's from Song of the that Lark. Is That's from that Song of the Lark, Thea, yes. Thea, Thea Kronberg. Thea and, and Thea Kronberg is really, Willa Cather? Well, certainly her emotional journey was, was my own. Uh, she's also a bit of Olive Fremsted, the, the great Wagnerian soprano. So, but this moment, you're holding in your, uh, in your head these two stories, uh, the white mulberry tree and Alexandra's story of a, a woman on, uh, on the Nebraska frontier. Mm -hmm. And something happens. Uh, well, it was a, a bit like a sudden inner explosion or, or enlightenment. And I suddenly realized that these two short stories belong together as one. And that realization came to me uh, and brought with it the inevitable shape of the thing, which is not plotted. It designs itself. And the design, indeed, seems so perfect, so right. And so you'd, you'd found your subject, Prairie, Nebraska, uh, but how did you get to Prairie, Nebraska? You came, you were born in the Shenandoah Valley. Yes. You came at the age of nine to Prairie, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that. 
We were met at the station, the train station, by wagons to take us out to the Catherton homestead. I was sitting on the hay in the back of the wagon, holding on to the wagon box to steady myself, because the, the roads, such as they were, were really just uh, faint trails over the bunch grass. And the land was open range with, with hardly any fencing. It was just like a, a, sheet, of, a sheet of iron out there, bare. And um, I remember thinking that it was like coming to the end of everything. <laughs> That phrase, uh, coming to the edge of the world, that in fact is something that Jim Verdon, uh, narrator, uh, your stand-in in your great novel, My Antonia, something that he says. Yes, yes. and do you remember that scene uh, when I had him kill that great big snake? That was because when I first got to Nebraska, one of the first things that interested me after I got over homesickness was this hickory cane with a steel tip on the end that my grandmother he used to carry with her out to the garden to kill rattlesnakes with. And she killed a great many snakes with that thing. So, and that just seemed to me to argue that life might not be quite so flat there as it looked. Let me ask you this question. A flat, windy landscape with rattlesnakes, and yet you found beauty? Oh, How sure. did you do that? Oh, well, the land and I had it out together. <laughs> and by the end of that first autumn, that shaggy grass country had gripped me with a passion that's Never let me go. It's been the happiness and the curse of my life. <laughs> You're portrayed as, because of your, your writing, O Pioneers and Song of the Lark and, and, and uh, 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 My Antonia, what's sometimes called the Nebraska Trilogy or the Pioneer Trilogy, as, as, as this wild girl uh, on horseback, skipping school, flying around the, uh, the prairie with the exotic Bohemians, Norwegians, Danes, Swedes, uh, even Germans. <laughs> It wasn't all that savage or romantic, actually. No, I got myself set up as a postman. So I, I would roam the prairie on my pony, visiting these immigrant families and delivering their mail, of course. And I'd listen to their stories. Their stories would just go round and round in my head at night. I felt, after visiting them, as though I'd actually gotten inside another person's skin. And truthfully, that's the way I always felt when I was creating my characters. You're, you're known as the, as the chronicler of, of these strong and romantic women. Uh, they're real characters. They're people you knew in Red Cloud, Nebraska. Well, well, yes and no. Now, my characters are, well, they're like the peace picture mosaic that I describe in the, in the Kohler's house in Song of the Lark. They're, they're not true portraits, they're, but they're composites of several people that I knew. But it's, it's unwise to assume that they actually are the people specifically who, who inspired them. You, you were in a large family, and your closest friends in some ways were your, your, your younger brothers, Roscoe and, and, and Douglas, who you lived with on the, the, the third floor of the, the, the family house. But your father, I guess recognizing you were a little unusual, <laughs> realized you needed, you needed something more? Well, I needed my solitude. After all, I was a girl, so <laughs> I needed my own room. He partitioned okay. off a, an L-shaped gable wing of that attic uh, and made a, a, a private room for me. Uh, Professor St. Peter, in one of your great books, The Professor's House, he, he, uh, he writes his, his own great, great book, his history of the Spanish explorers, makes money from that. He and his wife can afford to build a new house, which they do, but he can't leave the attic room where he's written his great work and had his his happiest times, the mm -hmm. fun of, of writing. And this is, it's also like Thea Kronberg in, in Song of the Lark. She has an attic room almost exactly like yours. Attics always figured prominently in my life. It's like where I preferred to, to do my writing. When I first started going to Jaffrey, New Hampshire, I found two lovely attic rooms in the Shattuck Inn there. And I would return there to, to write several years thereafter. In fact, friends of the innkeepers of the Shadokin, they, they erected a tent out in their field in, on their farm. It was about half a mile from the inn. So I'd have an even quieter place to work yeah. while I was there. I was, I was surrounded in this tent by wildflowers and woods and a lovely view of Mount Monadnock. And, and I wrote a great deal of My Antonia in that tent. So you wrote My Antonia or part of My Antonia in a tent? In a tent. In, in a, a field? field. <laughs> OK. <laughs> But you did finally escape Red Cloud, and you went to, uh, with your father's help, to the University of, of Nebraska in Lincoln. A, a pretty extraordinary place, but you had 
an almost immediate impact on the University of Nebraska. I have? wrote an essay on Thomas Carlyle for a class, and my professor sent it to the Nebraska State Journal and the Hesperian. Well, up until then, I thought I'd like to study medicine, but what youthful vanity can... And they published this the essay, the statewide <laughs> journal and the, your, your own literary, literary magazine, on the same day without knowing it. Yes. They, they, they published it simultaneously. Seeing myself in print resolved me to be a writer after that. But out of that experience, you came to write regularly for the Nebraska State Journal, for, uh, for the Lincoln newspapers. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, well, I did that to help pay my way through school and to send a little back home, because times were hard. But, uh, it was good for me, because it allowed me to, to work off that great purple flurry of my early writing style. So your, your early writing style became somewhat notorious among particularly actors and actresses and producers and whatnot of these, of these great traveling companies because you became the drama critic, the ferocious uh, drama critic, and your reputation became Yes, quite they called me the fierce. meat axe. The, the meat, meat axe. axe. So you, you, you have this love for women and this, this, this impassioned view of, of strong women and yet you disdained women writers. I cannot abide mawkish sentimentality or the sort of sex consciousness which I find abominable in the works of women writers. There's really only uh, four that have done anything worthwhile. There's the two Georges, of course, George Sand, George Eliot, and they were anything but women. <laughs> and there was uh, Miss Bronte, who kept her sentimentality under the control. And there was Jane Austen, who clearly had more common sense than any of them. And yet you are a woman writer. I'm a writer, Mr. Camper, period. <laughs> but you were submitting uh, stories, including stories to McClure's, mm -hmm. and, and, and you met Sam McClure, S.S. McClure, this yes. extraordinary yes. editor. Yes, in 1903, Sam McClure whisked me off to New York like a deus ex machina. He brought me to New York and he in one day, he got out of me my life story. He called his readers on the carpet for having dismissed several of my stories that I'd already sent in. <laughs> he said he brought you to New York saying he wanted to publish all your stories, and you said you'd been sending here stories to him yes. for, for months. Exactly. And they'd been rejecting them. <laughs> and then eventually he hired you as an editor in this phenomenal enterprise, McClure's, which yes. became famous because McClure invented muckraking, and so you became a muckraker. Oh, I've always hated that term. Ranks right up there with meat axe. <laughs> Now, McClure was mercurial, to say the least, yes. Well, but he, he was brilliant. He paid his people well. He gave them time to write truly masterful pieces. But also, he set you on some extraordinary projects that you've never really gotten complete credit for. Uh, you, you were put on the, the job to, to uh, do a salvation uh, expedition to Boston to save a book about Mary Baker Eddy that a woman named Georgine Milmine uh, had, had written. Had written. But, oh, I loathed that assignment. <laughs> I, the only good thing about it, though, is that in the nine months of exhaustive research in Boston, that's when I first met Sarah Orrin Jewett. And she's the one who inspired me to finally take courage and liberate myself from being the little drudge that I had become at McClure's. But out of this comes this expedition to the Southwest, the production of the Nebraska novels. About this time, as you're considering writing Song of the Lark, you, you, you take another trip to the Southwest with your companion, uh, Edith Lewis. Oh my goodness, that was quite the trip. I met Richard Wetherill's brother, Richard Wetherill. Um, he told me about how he had been pursuing these cattle, who, stray cattle, across the Mancos River and into the steep canyon. And he looked up and suddenly saw, through a, a veil of thinly falling snow, as it had stood 800 years ago, the Cliff Palace. It looked like it had been deserted yesterday. It was undisturbed and undesecrated. We spent a, an entire week just climbing through the ruins and a whole day on the Cliff Palace. It was marvelous. And this story, Wetherill's story, becomes Tom Outland's story uh, in the professor's yes. house. It, but also, there was a little bit of a story about yourself that made it into the New York Times. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm afraid the newspapers sensationalized the event somewhat. We were exploring an unexcavated cliff village called the Tower House with an inexperienced guide who got us lost. So uh, we wandered around for several hours looking for the way out and finally I said, we're just going to stay put right here and you go and find help. It was uh, quite an extraordinary evening watching the, the long summer twilight coming up and the 
the full moon rising up over that canyon. And it was uh, a rough 24 hours, but it taught me more than and, and, any other 24 and, and this, hours this in my life. This experience affects you, the Song of the Lark. It's really rewritten in, in, in Song of the Lark. And you published Song of the Lark, which is your most autobiographical novel. The, the opera is there. The cliff dwellings are there. Red Cloud, Nebraska is there. And it gets good reviews. But there's a, there's a moment when Heinemann, the, your English publisher, who published O Pioneers very happily, and, and Mr. Heinemann himself wrote you and turned it down. Yes. He wouldn't publish it. He said it was overwritten, which is an understatement to say the least. <laughs> I hadn't quite yet struck upon uh, the style of writing that I would eventually embrace, the style that I describe in the novel De Mueble. Your own life seems to have been furnished mainly with friendship. Uh, uh, up to that point. But it's the beginning of a shedding of some of that as, as Judge McClung dies and that house in Pittsburgh, which has been a refuge for you. At the time, I was sad. I was losing my friend. So I went off to the West to went visit. Went back to Red Cloud again? Yes, and to visit my brothers in, in Wyoming and, and uh, Arizona. And when I was in Red Cloud, I visited with uh, Annie Pavelka. And, by this time, she was, she was middle-aged, she was married, she had a large brood of children around her. And of course, when I knew her back in, in my childhood, she was a hired girl at, next door at her neighbor's, the miner's house. I went to visit my friend Elsie Sargent, and she had this Sicilian jar that was filled with scented stock. And I took the jar and I put it in the middle of a, a bare, round, antique table. And I, I moved a lamp. To, so the light would fall on the colors just so. And I, and I told her, I said, now I want my new heroine to be like this, like a rare object in the middle of a table that one can view from all sides, like Annie Pavelka. And she would be my Antonia. And you did produce this rare object, my, my Antonia, mm -hmm. which had sold well but had an incredible critical success continues to have a great critical and continue success and continues to sell. H.L. Mencken, Randolph Bourne, George Nathan, all the great critics of the time said, welcome this great new voice. And then you publish another book, the book after My Antony and your short stories, uh, one of ours, your World War I novel, yeah. published in 1922. And how did yeah. that break the world for you? Well, see, now you call it my World War I novel, and really that's, that's one of the inherent difficulties in, with my novel. You see, it wasn't meant to be a war novel, all right? It, it was a piece of fiction. It wasn't a piece of propaganda, and it was just meant to be a portrait of a, a dim young farm boy confronting his destiny. Your, your cousin, G.P. Cather, who yes. was killed in World War I. Yes, I recall when I heard that he'd been killed in France, I thought, well, truly, what a glorious thing to have happened to someone whose life up until that point had seemed rather pointless, to be True. honest. And yet, Hemingway, H.L. Mencken, who'd been your biggest supporter, most of the critic, Lionel Trilling, wrote, uh, wrote an essay about, uh, about how you didn't understand the war, how this is wartime propaganda. Uh, you, were, you were setting your sails to the prevailing winds of patriotism. Uh, in, instead of understanding the post-war disillusionment. Yes, well, perhaps I should have released it anonymously. I had clearly trespassed on sacred male turf. <laughs> you know, I will have you know that I received countless letters from people uh, thanking me for offering something in opposition to all those highbrows and those pacifists, you know, their, their negativism. It seems to me that the masses, which made my book a tremendous popular success, might have found comfort in my words for the loss of their own. Whereas Dos Passos and Hemingway and the like, they, they probably made them feel as though their Johnny was gone for no good reason at all. Well, of course, they might have been jealous because the book won the Pulitzer Prize. They might have been, yes. It sold 54,000 copies and made you rich. It yes, got it the admiration of, of what <laughs> Dwight McDonald would later call the middle brow critics, the Saturday Review of Literature, uh, et cetera. But the, the, the high brow critics didn't like it. After your Pulitzer Prize and the huge sales and the critical reaction, you write this small, beautiful, exquisite 
novel with this incredible character and Captain Forrester. Mm -hmm. What's the inspiration? Where did that come oh, from? Well, Lyra Garber, on whom Marion was, was based, she had been... A another Red Cloud yes. character from your youth. She had long been a beautiful ghost in my memory. And when I read about her death in the newspaper, a flood of memories ensued. And, and the story came to me complete in my mind, almost like I had read it somewhere. And all the memories of uh, picnicking in the Garbers Grove and, and my personal adoration of her, it, they all came spilling out onto the page through the eyes of Neil. See, that was the great experiment uh, in viewpoint, you understand. One gets to know uh, Marion Forrester. One sees her, not directly, but as reflected in the faces of others. You, you go from a, a lost lady to, in 1925, some, some people might say the Annus Mirabilis of, uh, of modern American literature, The Great Gatsby and American Tragedy, many other great works being published. And you published the most interesting, the most unusual, the quirkiest novel of, uh, of that era, The Professor's House. There, there is this notion in my mind that, that St. Peter looks out of this attic window in, in much in the way that you talk about creating the novel itself. Yes, well, uh, my favorite analogy for this particular fiction was uh, it came from an exhibition I saw in Paris of Dutch paintings. And in these paintings, there was often a, a scene of a, a living room, warmly furnished, or a kitchen with coppers and, and food about. And in the middle uh, was usually a square window through which you could see the masts of ships or you know, a, a stretch of gray sea. And I purposely overfilled the professor's house with stuffy new things, you know, uh, modern proprieties and coats and furs and until it, it became quite stifling. And then I wanted to open that window and let the fresh air just blow in from off the blue mesa. And that was Tom, Tom Atlan's story. And then you go back to Santa Fe, 1925, you go back to Santa Fe, the Southwest, um, and you see the Romanesque Cathedral there. Uh, you read this book on the life of uh, the Right Reverend Joseph Makabuf, who was the, the associate of Archbishop Lamy, the mm -hmm. famous 19th century uh, archbishop in, in New Mexico. And these these characters become the characters that you bring to life as Bishop Latour and Father Vaillant in Death Comes for the Archbishop. Mm -hmm. Well, I long wanted to try something in the style of legend, like the frescoes of the life of Saint Genevieve by Pouvis de Chavan. See, those frescoes, were, they were a series of panels, um, each depicting an episode in the life of the saint. And the movement from each panel was from one tableau to another tableau. And each tableau gave the viewer a sense of stillness and, and calm. And I, I long wanted to try something like that in prose, something without accent, without the um, artificial uh, elements of composition. Many people assume from reading uh, De uh, De Death Comes for the Archbishop that you become a uh, Catholic. <laughs> but in fact, isn't it really that you, you've returned to the epics, mythology, and lives of the saints of your youth? Yes, yes. Well, I was not a Catholic, no. I was an Episcopalian. But it's interesting uh, you know, about the, the, mir the miraculous in, in this story. Uh, Veillant, he, he, he's drawn to the miraculous in opposition to nature, uh, the big showy miracles, you know. But Latour, he sees miracles within nature. Wherever there's great love, there are always, always miracles. At the end of your life, you find another little miracle of, uh, of love, if you will. But you find this family with the young child prodigy, Yehudi Menuhin, mm -hmm. who becomes one of the great musicians of the 20th century, and you become their, their guide. <laughs> well, we met in Paris, Yehudi and his two sisters, Yalta and Hepzibah. Oh, they were such brilliantly gifted musical children, all three of them. And when they came back to America, I just simply took them under my wing. And we, we would go walking through Central Park around the reservoir, and we would read Shakespeare as a family out loud and, and through parties. And I told, I, I told Yehudi, I gave him some, some advice, because the, the problem that every American artist faces is the lack of companionship, of, of 
of seasoned and disciplined minds that one usually finds in Europe. But if one adopts Europe altogether, then one loses that sense of belonging, which is so important. So I told young Yehudi, I said, you're going to have to lead two lives just like I did. Well, Ms. Cather, your, your two lives, uh, as, as Yehuda Menuhin said uh, of you in his autobiography, you were his rock of strength and sweetness, and yet you were yourself always looking for that rock, and yet you found your final resting place in a cemetery in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, <laughs> inside of Monadnock. Yeah. Well, that is happiness, to be dissolved into something complete and great. Which you said in Maya Tania. You also in, wrote uh, an encomium uh, for another person that it seems to me uh, could stand for you. In later life, she traveled far, but her heart was always here, and all her journeys brought her home. Ladies and gentlemen, Willa Cather. <laughs> and the beauty and the simplicity of it all, I began looking at things with, with a greater appreciation, the way she talks about, you know, how you can never truly comprehend art unless you can see the beauty all around you everywhere. And as a result, I began looking around more. I began noticing that sort of thing, and it, and it gets inside you. Principal funding for Meet the Past with Crosby Kemper III is provided by the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, with additional financial support from Ken and Cindy McLean of Independence, Missouri, and by these fine organizations.